Buzz. Kids will blow dandelion fuzz And I'll be doing whatever snow does in summer God delights in blessing and he delights in blessing to bring joy and gladness to all peoples. That is the mission, the objective of the church, to bring the gospel, the good news of joy to all peoples. Open with us to Psalm 67 and let's see how that works out in our lives as followers of Jesus. It was one of those inspiring moments. There were 4,000 of us, maybe more, gathered in that auditorium musicians up on stage, singers up on stage, and 4,000 plus people, arms lifted up, singing in unison, these songs with a loud voice. And in that moment, I, I couldn't help but imagine what it will one, be, one day be like as the scriptures speak of in the, Old, in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament, picturing a day coming in the future. The last book of the Bible speaks about this. Revelation chapter 7, it says there's going to be this multitude so large that no one could number it. And people from every tribe and every nation and every language group represented there gathered before the throne of God. All of them worshiping, singing a new song to the Lord, Revelation chapter 7 says. Now, 4,000 people pales in comparison to a multitude that cannot be numbered, but we all have experienced at some point or another that large gathering of people, maybe in a stadium somewhere like has been happening the last few days up at Angel Stadium for the Harvest Crusade, where many people gathered with one voice singing together, arms lifted up, and it, there is an inspiring nature to that. And looking forward to the day that is prophetically typed or revealed to us at the end of the Bible. I'm sure that the psalmist who wrote the passage of Scripture we're going to look at today, some 3,000 years ago, a composer himself, a songwriter, that similar picture in view. Psalm 67 is where we're going to be today. If you have your Bible, open to Psalm 67. If you don't have a Bible, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring you one. The Psalms are right about the middle of your Bible. There's 150 of them, so you hard to miss the Psalms. Find Psalm number 67, and as you do, if you wouldn't mind standing with me, we're going to read from the scriptures just a short Psalm, seven verses, the heading of which says, To the chief musician on stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. We're not entirely sure who authored this psalm 3,000 years ago, but some composer had in mind musicians playing an accompanying music or tune to these words. God, be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Selah, that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on the earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Father, would you speak to us today and give us wisdom by your spirit to be able to see here in the scriptures your inspired word, which is living and powerful. Lord, help us to see application here in the text that in some way, maybe small, but maybe even in a big way, would transform the way that we understand your nature and, and our task in light of your nature in this world. So God, would you speak to us today? Help us to yield to the work that you want to do in us as we consider it here in Psalm 67. So, God, we 
We just ask for your presence in Jesus' name. And all those that agreed said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. God, be merciful to us and bless us. Cause your face to shine upon us. Selah. That last little word, as I've mentioned in previous weeks in our series here in the Psalms, Selah, it's it's a musical pause, a silence if you will, but for us it's kind of a meditative pause, and when I read it, the words that come to my mind are think about it. Just think for a moment these words. God, be gracious or merciful to us and bless us. Cause his face to shine upon us. And in thinking about those words, the reader of these words, 3,000 years ago when they were first penned, would have immediately acknowledged the association. The connection, the correlation with another passage of Scripture in the Old Testament. And if you've been a part of Cross Connection Church for any length of time, then you might even hear a connection because that passage in the Old Testament that the psalmist has in view when he says, God, be merciful to us and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us, those words are words that I share almost every single week following every single service as I give a benediction at the close of the service from Numbers chapter 6 in the Old Testament. You can turn there if you'd like. There's five books that open the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So the fifth book of the Bible, Numbers chapter 6, there in that passage is a blessing. A blessing which God ordained that Moses, if you've ever seen the Prince of Egypt or the Ten Commandments, you know Moses, that Moses was to give to his brother, a guy by the name of Aaron, who was a priest over a nation called the nation of Israel. And so God said, Moses, I want you to tell Aaron, the priest, that this is the blessing he is to pronounce over the worshipers of God when they come to appear before God at the tabernacle where they would worship. And so Numbers chapter 6 is what is referred to as the Aaronic blessing. Aaron was the priest and this was the priestly blessing for the worshipers of God. Numbers chapter 6 verse 22, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and to his sons, his descendants, saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, verse 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So you shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I, God says, will bless them. This was the blessing thousands of years ago that the priestly class of people were to pronounce over the worshipers of God. The Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And now the psalmist Hundreds of years after that was instituted for the priest to say over the people, the psalmist has this blessing in mind when he writes this song, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. That's what's in his mind as he thinks about this song that he's going to sing. But notice he changes it. It was a blessing that the priests were to pronounce. The Lord bless you. And now he prays it as a prayer. God bless us. Now that sounds like an audacious prayer. I was having a conversation this last week with a brother in the church here and we were talking about praying for people and he said, you know, sometimes I I find it easier for me to pray for other people than to pray for myself because when I pray for myself, I feel like I'm being selfish. Have you been there? Anyone ever felt like, if I pray for myself, I'm being selfish? And I was trying to encourage him that, you know, Jesus taught us to pray for our daily bread. So we, we, it's legitimate to pray for ourselves. Now, there is obviously an out-of-balance way that we can pray for ourselves, where all we ever do is pray for ourselves as if we were going through the in-and-out drive through and I'll have this, and I'll have this, and I'll have this animal style. You know, that sometimes it can be just completely self-focused, and that surely can be out of balance. But to never pray for yourself on the other side of the spectrum because you feel that maybe it's somehow selfish or arrogant... It is also not correct. But I can imagine that someone, maybe even sitting here right now, could feel a little bit uncomfortable praying the prayer, God, be gracious to me and bless me. 
and feel like, I don't know if I should pray that prayer. God bless me. Now, we, we're accustomed to say, God bless you. I noticed recently that one of my kids sneezed, and when they sneezed, they said, I bless you. <laughs> because they know every time we say, God bless you, after they sneeze. And so we have this tradition, this custom, don't we? And we don't always even know where it comes from. We just do it. It's a cultural custom that we do. And so now it's not a sneeze, it's a bless you. I bless you. And, and so we are accustomed to say, God bless you. But we're not so accustomed. In fact, there's a, a way in which we almost been trained under the scriptures sometimes to feel weird about saying, God bless me, God bless me. And and people, if you prayed that, you would feel uncomfortable praying that prayer in a gathering of people, a corporate prayer, and they said, would you pray? And you said, God, would you bless me? And people kind of looking at you like, what is wrong with this God? God bless me. Be gracious to me. Cause your face to shine upon me. Let's just pause and think about that. Right? It seems a little strange. God bless me. The psalmist did not feel uncomfortable about it at all. God be gracious to us, merciful to us, and bless us. Now, that word merciful in verse 1 is translated in several other English translations as gracious. It's the very same Hebrew word that is used back in Numbers chapter 6 where he says there in verse 25, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. So it is Equally right to say, God be merciful to us or God be gracious to us and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us. And the psalmist had no problem praying like that, even though some of us might feel uncomfortable praying like that. God be gracious to me and bless me. And so point number one that we find here in this passage in your sermon guide there in your bulletin, God's people should seek and expect God's blessing. God's people should seek and expect God's blessing. And immediately following that statement, it has to follow the question, do you? Are you seeking for, in prayer and by your obedience and by your way of life, are you seeking for and expecting God's blessing in prayer? your life. Now for some reason, and I actually can come up with a number of reasons as to why, but for some reason there are a lot of people in churches like this all over the country, all over the world, that have a a bit of a problem with that statement, God's people should seek and expect God's blessing. And I think one of the primary reasons that people have a difficult idea with that statement or a difficulty with that statement is a response to what is commonly referred to as the prosperity gospel or the prosperity theology, which in most ways, in many ways, originated in our wonderful nation, the prosperity theology or prosperity gospel. There are a number of people who identify as Christians and have churches and they they preach this thing called the prosperity theology gospel. It's a a small segment of the church, and there are many people in the church that have an aversion to it, and and rightly so, because unfortunately, there, there are people within the church who they have taken out of context many of the promises of the Bible, and as they take out of context the promises of the Bible, they can wrongly interpret those promises in a way that's improper or not in line with the Scriptures. But equally as unfortunate is that there are many people in churches like ours who, in response to or a reaction to those who improperly apply certain promises of the Bible, in reaction to that, we have a hard time accepting ideas like God's people should seek for and expect God's blessing. And so we have kind of an aversion to that mindset, even though I don't think we should. The psalmist did not hear He is very openly praying, God, be gracious to us. He's including himself in that prayer. And bless us and cause your face to shine upon us. It seems very self-centered. And whatever people group he's identifying as us, maybe it's ethnocentric. That God, be blessing us. That we might have an issue with it. But notice what's going on in this passage because there are some important things happening here. So he says, God, be gracious to us and bless us. The priests... Thousands of years ago, they were told by God that they were to pronounce a blessing over the worshipers of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
the Lord be gracious to you and cause his face to shine upon you, which in his face shining upon you is showering his glory upon you, his people. So the priests were to pronounce that as a blessing. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24, 25, 26. That was the blessing that they were to give. Now that blessing did not originate there. It didn't start there. It started several hundred years before, and it's recorded for us in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 12. If you turn there, please, Genesis, you can turn there like you're an authority on the Bible. It's the first book of the Bible. So Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, God is calling a person to follow him. This person's name is Abram or Abraham, and he in history is the father of the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And so God is calling this man Abraham to follow him, and he says this in Genesis chapter 12, back there in verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, or Abraham, get out of your country from your family to your father's house to a land that I will show you. So breaking that down, God called Abraham to follow him. I want you by faith to leave everything that you know, everything that's common and comfortable, and come follow me. That's risky. Abraham did. He followed the Lord, we're told later on in this passage. Why did he follow the Lord? It would seem kind of ludicrous. He's 75 years old. The Bible tells us at this point, he's kind of already, you know, got everything set up where he was living and God just comes to him and a voice speaks to him and says, I want you to leave everything. Come follow me to a land that I'm going to show you. Why would he even do that? Well, because of this. Verse 2, the same voice said, I will make you a great nation. That sounds good, doesn't it? And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So hundreds of years before Aaron and his sons were commanded by God to bless the people, the descendants of Abraham, with this blessing. The Lord bless you and curse, or the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. Hundreds of years before they were told to bless the people with that blessing, God spoke to their father Abraham and he said, I want you to follow me and I will bless you. And the nature of this blessing to Abraham and through Abraham. Many for hundreds and, year, hundreds and hundreds of years in the past and now even today have interpreted this blessing to be for Abraham and his descendants only. But if we look at what is being said in Genesis chapter 12 and how the psalmist interprets it here in Psalm 67, how he proclaims it in these seven verses, then we will see that this blessing has a much wider scope than just Abraham and just his descendants which is really important for us to grasp as we study through the scriptures. And so the psalmist here in Psalm 67, flip back there if you would, Psalm 67 verse 1, he says, God be merciful, be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Selah. Think about it. And in thinking about it, we we discover that he's connecting it with the blessing, the priestly blessing of Numbers chapter 6. And in thinking about it, we step back even further and we see the Abrahamic blessing that God gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And so he's pointing back to those things. God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. But then we're led immediately in the next verse to the result of this blessing. So he's praying, God bless us. He's seeking the blessing of God. And now the result, verse 2, Psalm 67, verse 2. That your way may be known in the earth, your salvation among all nations. Now I think all of us would acknowledge that words, even little words, are really important. And there's a a small word that begins this verse that's very important, the word that. In the New International Version and the HCSB version, two English versions, it says, so that. But would you circle the word that? You can lean over your neighbor's Bible, just circle it for them. They won't mind. Uh, (laughs) That your name or your way may be known in all the earth, your salvation among all nations. That Little word, that, or those two words, so that, are super important because they identify the motivation behind this audacious prayer. This is an audacious prayer, but there's a solid motive behind it. 
God, be gracious to us and bless us. Cause your face to shine upon us so that for the purpose of your way will be known in all the earth, your salvation among all nations. The motivation behind this audacious prayer is the glory of God among the nations. That all people would see and know the fame and the glory of God. Because this blessing, point number two on your outlines, this blessing, God's blessing, is for all peoples. God's blessing is for all peoples. We are blessed to be a blessing. That was true thousands of years ago with the first follower of God by faith, Abraham. He's called the father of the faith in the scriptures. He's the first one who followed God faithfully. There, thousands of years ago, Abraham followed God by faith to receive a blessing, but it was a blessing for the purpose of being a blessing. We see that there. Let me just read it to you again. Genesis 12, verse 2. I, God says, will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a what? blessing. I will bless you and you shall be a blessing. So Abraham, thousands of years ago, was blessed by God to be a blessing. And if you today are the recipient of the blessing of God, you are blessed to be a blessing. And as we'll see in a moment, you are the recipient of blessings from God. And we're blessed to be a blessing. God went on, Genesis 12, 3, the very next verse, I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you or through you, all the nations, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So I'm going to put a blessing on you so that others are blessed. God's people should seek and expect God's blessing. And then they should seek and expect to be a blessing. They receive the blessing to give the blessing. And one of the most tragic outcomes of being the recipient of blessing, I can think of three of them. You might want to write these down. The most tragic outcomes of being the recipient of blessing, number one, is to think that you deserve it. Number two, to think that it is, it is exclusive to you. And number three, to hoard it. The most tragic outcomes of being a recipient of blessing, number one, to think that you deserve it, number two, to think that it is exclusive, and number three, to hoard it. First, number one, to, to think that it is out of deserving it. God blessed Abraham because of God's grace. And if you notice in Psalm 67, verse 1, the mercy or grace of God comes before the blessing. God, be gracious to us and bless us. Now, absolutely, you can make the case that the grace is a blessing, and it is. But the further blessings of God are only accessible by His grace. Amen. The blessings of God are not accessible by your works. This is clear throughout the scriptures. From Genesis to Revelation, across the 66 books of the Bible, it is clear that God's favor, His blessing, comes upon people not by their merit. It is unmerited, undeserved favor, grace. And if you're a Christian here today, that is, you've received the blessing of God in salvation and the further blessings of God, the benefits of salvation, you have received that not because you're a good person, not because you've done anything meritous at all. It's just God has given it to you out of his grace. Amen. And if you're not a Christian here today, and we're so glad that you're here, don't think that you have to do A, B, C, D, E, and F before you can receive the blessing of God. If I, if I just get my life better, if I just start you know, working these things out, then I'll get God's grace. No, the Bible is clear. For by grace you are saved. Through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Any blessing we have from God is according to his grace. So, one of the major pitfalls, the traps of being a recipient of God's blessing is to begin to think, number one, that you deserve it. Number two, to think that it is exclusively only for you 
or the people around you. And this is always man's default because man has fallen, because we're sinful. Our default is to think we deserve it and then to think that it is ours because, you know, we're something really special. And it's not for the rest of those people. And God wanted to make sure that the people he selected, Abraham, Abraham's son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, Jacob's 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel, the nation of Israel. He wanted them to know this is not exclusively for you and you don't deserve it. So at the very beginning of them getting ready to come into the land that God was going to bless them with, it's called the promised land. God gathers up the whole nation of the people of Israel, hundreds of thousands of them. He gathers them together and Moses gives this huge message. It's called the book of Deuteronomy. And if you think my messages are long, read the book of Deuteronomy. This one message. And so God gets all the people together and he says, I'm going to give you this great land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's an awesome blessing that I am pouring out upon you and your descendants. It is for you as a people. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 7, he says, I don't want you to think that I'm giving this to you because you're something great, because you're not. I'm merely giving this to you because I love you. Unmerited, undeserved favor. So he gathered them all together and just said, I don't want you to think that this is yours exclusively. Now, as I said, the default, the tendency of sinful people, and we're all sinful people, is to try to make things exclusive. And if you fast forward from Deuteronomy 7, where God says, you're not getting this because you're special, just because I love you, you fast forward 2,500 years almost, then you get to the time when Jesus came to the earth, and during that time, many of the people in that nation, the nation of Israel, living there in that land that God had given to them, by that time they thought, this is ours only, and it's not for other people. In fact, some of the things that Jesus did and said that made them the most angry was when he said to people who were not Jewish, Gentiles, he said, I have not found such great faith in all of Israel as I found in you, Gentile. And all the people who were the Jewish people there would go, how dare you? Kill him. It's ours only, our blessing, not for everybody else, never God's intent. So the first pitfall of receiving God's blessing is to think that you deserve it. The second is to think that it is exclusively yours. Third is to hoard it which is the logical outgrowth of, I deserve it, and it's exclusively mine. Therefore, let's hold it for us alone. The rest of the world can't have it. And that is not God's heart. And it wasn't only the Jewish people 2,000 years ago who came to that wrong conclusion. There have been many Christians who also fall into that wrong conclusion. How does it manifest? Well, it says things like, this is the only right church. You are not saved unless you're a part of this church or baptized in this way. It manifests in those sort of ways. It manifests in people thinking or saying, we and our family and those like us are the only elect and the rest are those, well, sorry, you're reprobate, you're going to go to hell. We always, according to our fallen nature, move towards exclusivity and hoarding. And God is not like that. He said to his disciples, freely you have received, freely what? Some people have heard that verse before. (laughs) Freely you've received, freely give. And so we are to be those who are conduits of this blessing. We do not deserve it. It is not exclusive to us. And therefore, we cannot hoard it, but give it out. So in summary so far of verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 6, we're moving really quick. Psalm 67, 1 and 2. We, the people of God, should seek and expect God's blessing. If you're a follower of Christ, you put your confidence, your trust in Him, then you should seek for and expect God's blessing. But the result of that blessing is that you should seek and expect then to be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. Others not like us, others outside of these walls, others in this county, others in other parts of the world, in other countries, we're to be a blessing. So we should seek and expect to receive God's blessing. We should seek and expect to then be a blessing. The second result is found in verse 3, Psalm 67, verse 3. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let All the peoples praise you. Point number three on your outline, God's blessing should 
result in worship. God's blessings should result in worship. It should result in worship in my heart, in your heart. If you're the recipient of God's blessing, it should stir you to praise God for what he's given to you. We, we read in the scriptures, we sing songs like, praise God from whom all blessings flow, what's called the doxology. So we, because we've received blessings, should worship God, but God's blessing should result in worship globally. It should be the extension of that worship of God. Let the peoples praise you. Let all the peoples praise you. Again, circle the word all. A, a small word with great importance. It's not exclusive, this blessing. We should seek and expect God's blessing. We should seek and expect to be a blessing as a result of receiving the blessing and as a result, we should seek to extend the worship of God. The psalmist here recognizes and understands that God's blessing upon Abraham and Abraham's descendants, Isaac and Jacob and the 12 sons of Jacob or the 12 tribes of Israel and that nation, that blessing upon them was for the purpose of global praise and glory of God. It was so that all the nations ultimately would worship and glorify God, the one who gives the blessing. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The blessing to Abraham was to be a blessing through Abraham to bring about worship of God among all nations, among all peoples. And any other reading or interpretation of Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, any other interpretation of what is commonly referred to as the Abrahamic covenant as it being exclusively for Abraham and his descendants, is a wrong reading of the passage. It is for the glory of God among all nations. That's the purpose, both thousands of years ago and today. And so again, in summary of these first three verses, we should seek and expect God's blessing. As a result, we should seek and expect to be a blessing. As a further result, God's blessing should produce praise in us and in others. The next result the beginning of verse 4, Psalm 67, verse 4. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. The ultimate purpose of God's blessing, it's point number four on your outline, God's blessing is for global joy and gladness. God's blessing is for global joy and gladness. It's important at this point to backtrack just for a moment and think about what is this blessing that I'm talking about? Because I've been using the word blessing a whole bunch of times, but what exactly is this blessing of God that we should seek and expect and extend and praise God for and that should ultimately bring the joy and gladness of all nations? Well, again, look at the beginning of the passage, Psalm 67, verse 1. He says, God, be gracious to us and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us that your way may be known in the earth your salvation among all nations. God blessed, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, the, the people of Abraham, Abraham's descendants. He blessed the nation of these worshipers of God. Numbers chapter 6, verses 20, 24, 25, 26. He blessed these people so that through them would come the blessing to all nations. What is that blessing? It is the way and salvation. Who is that blessing? Jesus. The blessing that is to come to and through the descendants of Abraham to all nations is not the nation of Israel. It is the Messiah, Jesus. He is the blessing. Which is why this really simple point, point number five, God's blessing is Jesus. He is the way that your way, God, may be known in all the earth. Your salvation among all nations. What does Jesus, the name, mean? Jehovah is salvation. The psalmist, a thousand years before Jesus comes to earth, he says, the purpose of God's blessing, 
causing his face to shine upon his people, being gracious to them and blessing them. The purpose is that the way, Jesus, and the salvation, Jesus, would be known to all nations. Now, how many non-Jewish people are here today? Look around. Raise your hands. Look around. This prayer is being fulfilled. Because the great majority of us sitting here today are not Jewish. Right? So the psalmist prayed here. God, bless us. And he's praying at this moment as a Jewish person living 3,000 years ago. Bless us as a people so that we would be a blessing and your way and your salvation would be known among all nations. In 2015. The, the focus of the Abrahamic covenant is Jesus. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. If you can read Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and you miss Jesus, then you've missed the point. God blessed Abraham and his descendants to bless the world with Jesus, who ultimately, the psalmist says here in Psalm 67, verse 4, the beginning of it, Jesus ultimately brings global joy and gladness. How does he do that? Well, first, he does that by ushering in the gospel, which is good news for all nations. And it's good news that brings great joy. That's what the scriptures say. The gospel is good news that brings great joy. So Jesus came, God became a man that's called the incarnation. He lived a sinless life. He died a brutal death. He rose from the dead and ascended into heaven to begin to fulfill this prayer of blessing. Jesus is the decisive fulfillment of this prayer of blessing to all nations in his incarnation, in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and fulfilling it in the future in his second coming, which is what the psalmist is here looking for. But here at this point, he says, this gospel is going to bring joy and gladness to all nations. So we, if you're a follower of Jesus today, we are to be those who are working for the joy of all people. That our lives as followers of Jesus, the purpose of our life is to extend and to experience and to express joy and gladness and bring it into the world. We're to work for the joy of all peoples. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians, he says, I am a worker together for your joy. That was his task as a pastor. A worker together for joy. So Christians should be involved in tasks in the world that spread gladness. That's a fun job. As a Christian, your job is to make people happy in Jesus. The best way, the most primary way that we do that is by giving forth the good news that brings great joy, the gospel. That's the primary way that we extend gladness, happiness to the world is through the preaching of the gospel. That's the prime way. The secondary way would be to do good things by bringing water, fresh, clean water to people who don't have it. Would you say that that makes people in other countries happy? Yes, that's a good thing that the church should be about. By getting rid of things like malaria in the world, that's a good thing that makes it a glad place in the world. By getting rid of things like HIV in Africa or by taking care of social justice things around the world, those are all good things that are good things for us to give to and to be committed to because they increase the joy and gladness of the nations. But the primary thing that we are to be given to is the declaration of the gospel, which is good news that produces great joy. And so here the psalmist prays, Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Oh, that the world would be happy. How many of you would agree that the world is experiencing a significant lack of gladness? And we, the people of God, are to be those who extend gladness through the gospel to all nations. That's good work, enjoyable work. And it takes place in your workplace, on the construction site that you work at. It takes place on your campus if you're in school. It takes place wherever God carries you to be a worker for the joy of other people, primarily through the extension of the gospel, the good news that brings great joy, but also by doing things that increase joy. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. 
And then the psalmist moves prophetically to the future. For you, God, shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on the earth. Think about it. This is the compelling thing that brings great joy. There's coming a day, church, there is coming a day when Jesus shall rule and reign with righteous judgment. And, and we live in a nation, a great nation, that even has one of the best justice systems in the world. And all of us sitting here today would recognize that sometimes even some of the greatest justice systems are unjust, right? right. Yeah. And so we look forward to a day when he rules and reigns in righteousness. And so the psalmist says, oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Why? For, there's that connecting word, you, God, shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on the earth. When will that take place? Well, it's not happening yet. And so it's something to look forward to. The advent, the second coming of Jesus, when he fulfills this blessing being spoken of here. And every Orthodox Christian, that is, Christians who believe right things, believe in and look forward to the second coming of Christ. And so he says, there's coming a day when you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations of the earth. This is pictured in other passages of Scripture. You can look later if you'd like at Psalm, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. It looks forward to a day when Jesus, the son of David, King David, lived 3,000 years ago and God gave him a promise that the Messiah, the Christ, would come through his descendants and Jesus did come through his descendants. And in Isaiah 11, 1, written 700 years before Jesus came, Isaiah says, there's going to come one, the son of David, and he with righteousness shall judge the poor. Verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 11 says, and will decide with equity the meek for the meek of the earth. So we look forward to that day when that day comes. And the psalmist sings, looking forward. He has joy as he looks forward and says, God, we're looking forward to the day when you shall judge the earth with righteousness. When you shall be enthroned here over all nations, not just one nation, but for all nations. And then the psalmist returns to the co chorus in verse 5. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. A great, at that very same conference that I was at back in 2011, where 4,000 of us worshiping the Lord a pastor stood up who's also the author of a book called Let the Nations Be Glad, which happens to be based on this passage of Scripture. And he stood up and spoke on this passage, Psalm 67. It was great. But let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. That same author, he begins his book, Let the Nations Be Glad. Missions exist because worship doesn't. What is the purpose of the endeavor of the church to spread the gospel to all peoples. The purpose is the global praise of God. Point number six on your outline. God's people should seek to experience and extend God's blessing. God's people should seek to experience and extend God's blessing. Until when? Until all the peoples praise God. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. The psalmist looks forward to the day when God wraps all things up, and he brings this global blessing among all nations. And we, if you're a follower of Jesus today, should be committed to the task of experiencing and extending God's blessing through the gospel and through whatever endeavor increases joy and gladness in the world. We should be committed to that work with our time, with our energy, with our talents, with our money, with everything that we have. And you may never go to a foreign country. That's okay because right here in this area, that's your task. Our job is to increase the gladness of all peoples, whether they live in Burma or India or they live in San Marcos. And I can tell you, people in San Marcos need joy increased. And people in San Diego County need joy increased and gladness. And it doesn't come through a new Chargers football stadium. I hate to break it to you. It comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The task is unfinished. Many Christians today 
look at the Old Testament of the Bible, the first two-thirds of the Bible, only for what those passages might have to say about future things, eschatology. I have two things I know for certain as it results to future things. Number one, Jesus will come back. Number two, he hasn't come back yet. Which means the task is not done. There are more than 6,000 distinct ethnic groups, people groups, that still do not know or hear or have the gospel. There are a lot of unhappy people. And so, Father, would you stand with me? Father, we ask that you would stir our hearts to be conduits of blessing for all nations. That we would not be those who think that we deserve the blessing of salvation or that it is exclusively for just this church or that we would hoard it. Lord, we pray that the good news of the gospel would go out from this church and other churches in our area so that the 3.2 million people here in San Diego County, more than 90% of them are not a part of an evangelical Bible teaching church. Lord, that the 3.2 million people of San Diego County would know the gladness of the good news of the gospel. And Lord, we pray that you would cause this church to grow for your glory and for your praise and that you would cause Emmanuel Faith and Mission Hills and North Coast Church and Maranatha Chapel and all the other churches in our area that are committed to the task of preaching the good news of the gospel, that they too would grow for your glory in the world and that we would see people continue to go to the unreached for your namesake and for the joy of all peoples. God, enable us to be that conduit of blessing this week, even if it seems in such a small way in an office building here in San Diego or at a school campus here in Escondido. Help us to be conduits for your blessing. In Jesus' name, and all those that agreed, said. So.